everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast, presented by Dream Cricket. I'm your host, Peter Dolphin, and on this week's episode, we have one of the most beloved members of the USA Men's National Team, Nastush Kenjige. You'll be hard-pressed to find somebody in the national team setup who has a bad thing to say about Nash. A good guy, a good role model, a good inspiration for anybody who's looking to find the secret to success on the pathway to the national team. There are few better places to look than the example laid out by Nostosh Kenjige. So we'll talk to him about his journey as he prepares to take on Ireland in the historic first bilateral tour hosted by USA against a full member nation starting on December 22nd in Florida. But first, I want to remind everybody that you can subscribe to the podcast on Patreon to help keep it going on an episode-by-episode basis for as little as $3 a month. Go to patreon.com to help support the podcast today. The Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast is also powered by Dream Cricket and Moosa Cricket Stadium at the first and original turf wicket facility in the state of Texas. For more information, call 713-534-2195. That's Moosa Cricket Stadium in Pearland, Texas. Today's edition of the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast, we have a regal guest on the show, the king of the desert, Nastush Kenjige. Nash, welcome to the show. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for having me. Oh, king of the desert, yep. <laughs> It's you. So there's two ways that I know Nasdush Kenjige. One is how he first introduced himself to me as the only Nasdush Kenjige on Facebook, which I'm pretty certain to this day is still the case. And he's also the king of the desert. So please explain for the people who don't know the genesis of what these two things mean. How did you get the name? Nastush Kenjige, because it's an extremely unique name. Yeah, it is. I think it, it still holds uh, true that I'm the only Nastush on Facebook. I'm not sure if, the, if I'm the only king, though. <laughs> um, so I was, I was born in Alabama. My parents were here for about three, four years. And they wanted, they wanted a name that suited some place here. And in Arizona, they speak a tribal language called Navajo. And in Navajo, Nastush means king of the desert. So, yeah, that's where my name came from. <laughs> so how did your dad or your parents both have this affinity that they developed for the Navajo people? Being in Alabama, your dad was working at the Tuskegee Institute at the time. Your dad is an agricultural farmer, for people who don't know. So that was part of the reason why he was at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, which is famous for those things. But prior to that, he was in Arizona doing some postgraduate work so how did his relationship develop with the Navajo people to the extent that he wanted to pay tribute to them by giving his son a name out of Navajo that's a tricky question Peter um, my, my dad likes to read a lot and he writes a lot too so I think it's just his curiosity of the place of the people of his environment here that led him to just be curious about everything around and then he just decided well let's just give him a name that's unique yeah apart from that I'm not sure I, I really never asked because when I was in India Nostrosh was a hard name to pronounce and all my teachers in school just pronounced it wrong there was not a single teacher who got it right so I would go by Nachu I would go by Nachiket so I've, I've had two three names that are not Nostrosh but once I came to the US they find it easier to pronounce my name here and Nosh is easy too so no complaints now, but in India, I had a lot of complaints. I can sympathize with you because I'm a lifelong charter member of the Mangled Names Club. Della Pena, for some reason, is a tongue twister for a lot of people in New Jersey, even though there's quite a sizable Italian population in New York, New Jersey. But I don't know why Della Pena just was a handful for a lot of people. So hearing you describe your experiences with, yeah. with Nostash. I mean, I wouldn't think Della Pena is that hard, yeah. But it's just some people prefer pronouncing some things right and they just don't get some part right. So I guess, yeah. The worst I had was growing up with telemarketers. Telemarketers really don't exist anymore. But growing up, any telemarketer, we could spot within 10 seconds in a phone call if the person who was calling actually knew who the hell we were as a family or if they were some random telemarketer because the dead giveaway was they couldn't pronounce our name. 
And, and that was the signal to just hang up. If they couldn't pronounce the name, they clearly didn't know who the hell we were as a family. Hang up. Next call. That's a good giveaway, yeah. <laughs> don't get your name right. You know it's it's a call that you don't want to listen to. <laughs> Did you have those experiences at all? Did you have telemarketers harassing you and your family and getting your name wrong growing up in India? Um, the thing in India is they don't they don't go by your name, so they don't care about what your details are. They just start from what they want to sell. So they skip that part where they try to ask you what you do or what's your name. It's just straight to the point. They want to sell X Y Z. That's it. So I didn't have to deal with that. Lucky man. Yeah. Now, one of the other unique things about you, mm-hmm. people who are not aware, and I'm pretty sure this is still the case, you've got, is it four or five siblings in your family? I have a lot of cousins, but it's just one brother. Just one brother. Okay. You yeah, got one I brother. Of, yeah. I have about six, seven cousins, and we're all close. Um, we grew up together. We went, it's, it's mostly like, Back in Chikmangalore, it's all all of us live together. Not together, we live close by. So in our holidays, we would spend all our free time in somebody else's house together. So it was a lot of hanging out with all of them. So we're still very close. Yeah. You got one brother. Okay. It was, it's a younger brother, I believe. But amongst your family, you, your parents, and your brother, you're the only American citizen. Yeah, just me. Not even, not even my brother. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for the entire life of his <laughs> it's been a source of the sibling rivalry you got the american identity he, he doesn't <laughs> he, I, yeah that's one thing he always is envious of like he even he's not an american citizen even my dad my mom they're all indian citizens so it's just me and i keep giving him that to him. <laughs> i keep letting him know that i'm an american every now and then but now i've applied for his green card so I don't know, it'll take about 15, 20 years. So let him wait. <laughs> so explain it for people. So you were born in Alabama. That's another unique thing about you. You might be the only international cricketer, I'm fairly certain, who was born in Alabama. Of all the places you could have been born in the U.S., that's where you're born. So born in Auburn, Alabama. But soon after that, your family went back to India, correct? That's right, yeah. And your dad, we touched on a little bit of- earlier but he's an agricultural farmer he's also done some writing in terms of you told me once he translated books in the local language in Canada in uh Karnataka your dad is a man of many talents your dad is like the Dos Equis uh <laughs> man no yeah what you don't realize is I think he's a bigger fan of you uh, <laughs> he just yeah he was so so the first time he, he heard about you was when you wrote our articles and covered USA cricket. And I told him about what you do and how you started watching cricket, how you started writing about it. And he was so curious. He was like, I was even doing that. <laughs> I haven't seen anybody in the US following US cricket and just writing about US cricket. So he keeps a check on you all the time. Yeah, he just wants to know how you're doing. But yeah, he, he does he does write books. Um, that's his part-time I would say a hobby. Um, he's translated one or two books from English to a local language, Canada, and uh, he's also written with some of the prominent writers in our language. Yeah, he just loves doing it. Well, that's a side gig. So pretty, your dad, Dosekis, he's the most interesting man in the world that I know, pretty Kenjige. He's also an agricultural farmer and he has the finest coffee beans in all of Karnataka. Uh, Sure. I mean, I don't think he'll claim to have fighters beans, but we do grow coffee. Um, Come on, you got you got to you got to sell your product, Nash. What do you mean? No, 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 no. You gotta you gotta hawk it. <laughs> yeah, let's. Uh, we'll keep it for the end, where I can just give a shout out to coffee. <laughs> but yeah, we do grow coffee. Um, we are we are farmers. By my dad is a so we grow coffee. Um, Does your family grow any other crops or no? Um, yeah, so after he finished his studies here, he always wanted to go back because we had we have a lot of plantations back home. So we grow coffee, and along with coffee, we grow pepper, cardamom, but they're, they're just the um, supplementary to coffee. It's run through our family. So my grandmom has been doing it, my granddad. So it's what we do. So their plan was always to just get education here and then go back to the roots. When they were here for those two, three, three, four years, that's when I was popped. You say that's what we do. It's not what you do, though. You escaped. You got out of the family business. How did that happen? <laughs> if not for cricket, like I'm so thankful for cricket. I had a master's degree in biomedical engineering. So I always knew that 
I'll be coming to the US just to work. So in 2015, I came here to work as a biomedical engineer. And for the two, three years between 2015 and 2017, I worked as a full-time biomedical engineer. And then I think cricket just pulled me back. Like in India, all I did was play cricket. And it was, it was something that I didn't expect that it would happen. Um, it was the rewards of all those years of hard work, the sacrifices, just the persistence that something happened of this nature in the US. Um, so if not for cricket, I think, I don't know, maybe I would have had to go back at some point and look after the plantations or, but right now I've just told my brother to look after it. So he's, he's in line, <laughs> he's, get, he's getting trained. He's the one under my dad and he's getting, he's, he's being he's shadowing my dad. So he has to grow up and make sure he looks after those responsibilities at least for a while now. <laughs> Now, you said you played cricket growing up in Karnataka, and you referenced Chick Magalore. You're from Chick Magalore in Karnataka, but you went to college. The earliest scorecard I can find for you on Cricket Archive is playing for the Dianand Sagar College of Engineering in the Bangalore Cricket League. So uh, how did you pursue cricket, and to what standard were you in the Bangalore pathway while you were doing your education there and cricket being a part of that? Oh, wow, you looked up. Yeah, so those scorecards are from the engineering days. It's funny you say that because even in my school days where I studied in Lawrence, there would be days, so there was a, something called a paper score. So if you scored a 25 not out, then you would be on the paper the next day. Or if you took three wickets, you would be on the paper. So whenever I played in school and got a three, four, a score 25, we would collect all those paper cuttings and then put it in a book. So I have a lot of those from school, but I guess they're not in, in the online archives. <laughs> but yeah, even when I was growing up, like uh, my dad always insisted that I always had a backup. I would continue to play cricket right through, but he always knew that he always wanted me to have a backup. So he just made sure at whatever stage I was playing cricket, I had something to fall back on. So he made sure that I did my engineering I didn't want to do it. He pushed me into it. I had no clue if I wanted to do engineering or whatnot. And then he also made sure I got my master's done. So when I was doing these, these, the colleges, the schools, they all supported me right through. They were okay with me not attending class. They were okay with me playing games all the time. I'm just thankful for all the support right through those times. And if not for the support from my family, the teachers, and all the mentors, the coaches, I wouldn't have been where I am now. You talk there about making sure that your teachers were okay with skipping classes so you could play cricket. So when you were going around New York City fixing x-ray machines, were you just pretending to look at the machines and fix things or did you actually know what you were doing? Um, I don't know if I can go on. <laughs> I think I did a good job. Um, it was a very challenging job. Um, I had to drive around New York, go from hospitals to hospital and you know, fix equipment. But at the same time, well, like, well, let me interrupt there. Take us through a typical day. So when, for, again, for people who aren't aware, you touched on it a little bit. Your first job when you came to the U.S., you cricket was not at the forefront when you first came after you got your master's. I think you came to Virginia originally because you had cousins or, or friends in Virginia. And then you worked your way up to New York within a few months in late 2015, early 2016. But your first job, you were in either Brooklyn or Long Island, and you would go into the city to fix, go from hospital to hospital, fixing medical equipment or diagnosing issues with medical equipment so that you could then order the parts to get them fixed. And that could be x-ray machines, MRIs, CAT scan machines, high, high grade medical equipment. So take us through a typical day. What was a typical day like for you when you first were involved in working these jobs? And especially as you started to rediscover cricket in the New York City cricket scene, from 5 a.m., 6 a.m. until 10 o'clock at night, take us through a typical day in the life of Nastish Kenjige. Yeah, sure. Um, so before, like you said, before I rediscovered cricket, it was pretty easy. I didn't have any other responsibility to cater to. So I would wake up at about 7, 7.30, and then I would get my whole schedule of where to go and repair what. So I would drive to any place in the borough, and there would be there would be times when I would have to drive to Boston, Maine, it was actually all of the east side of US. So I could be driving to Northeast, I could be going down South to Philly. I would start my work at around nine and then 
go about finishing jobs until 5:36 so at that point i didn't have anything else to do and it was good money so i guess i was just living a life that usually people do and then in a year and a half cricket came back to my life and then that got me excited because now i had something to look forward to every day like that is something i wanted to do so but at the same time i couldn't quit my job because there was no contracts or there was no money in cricket at that point so i would make sure i, I would make sure i put up my training so i would go to the gym early morning at around 5:30 or 6 and then finish up my gym training running and then head to work straight from there and then work the whole day and then wherever i ended up so there would be times when i would end up in queens in bronx and then i had to drive all the way down to jersey so i would practice in crick max so the guys there they know i would leave my work at 3:30 i would reach jersey crick max at around 5 5:30 or even 6 through that traffic and what not so it would be the rush hour so it was about 2 to 1 half hours of driving straight to crick max get my practice done and then go home at 8:30 or 9 so that that was my schedule once cricket started and i had no nothing to complain about because that is what i enjoyed doing so i was only complaining about 9 to 5 when i was supposed to work <laughs> the rest of the time I, i was in my elements i was working out i was happy i was practicing what i knew best so those were the days like which i miss but now since i don't work it's a lot easier so i can i can be flexible during the day and see what works when and then figure it out and this was a five day a week activity this was a five day a week routine for you yes yeah this would be on the five days and on the weekends we would usually have games so i would play games in jersey mostly in jersey and some games in new york that would be on saturday sunday yes now part of the reason why you were doing this fanatical schedule during monday through friday was because at this stage you had attended an ICC combine an ICC America's USA cricket combine in New York City which is where you were first discovered and identified that was at Van Cortlandt Park in the summer of 2016 and that's when you were identified and invited to a USA national team camp in Florida that was centered around the CPL when the CPL was still coming to Florida and that's when you discovered there was this opportunity that existed you could you could go play for the USA national team. Not only did you discover it, I think your parents first discovered it then too. They had no idea what the hell was going on and why you were pursuing this lunatic schedule uh in pursuit of playing international cricket for USA. Part of why you were doing that was the eligibility rules at the time. The rules have since changed, but the ICC had a quirky loophole even though you were a citizen and by rights you really should have been able to represent USA immediately as an American citizen. They still wanted to enforce a requirement that to demonstrate your your allegiance or your commitment to the cause you had to prove that you were coaching or contributing something to the local cricket community x amount of days per year i think it was 100 days per year and, and what was considered 100 days per year was 8 hours 8 hours of work equal to day so if if you did this 4 hours a day going to Crick Max in the evening to do coaching or or local development work at Crick Max 4 hours was a half day doing it 2 days in a row would equal 1 day and you had to just do this nonstop and then if you did it on a weekend too during the winter that would be a full day that was one of the reasons why you're doing this when you told your parents what was their reaction <laughs> it's funny um so all of this time when i went to the regionals the not the regionals the the selections in new york i told my parents nothing about it so all they thought was all i was doing was working because i didn't want to tell them mainly because they had lived through all these disappointments of me not getting picked through the age ranks of 13 15 17 19 like there were times when i would go for zonal selections state selections ranji i mean not ranji state selections and not get picked so at this point i was like i'm just not going to tell them i'm going to try i'm i'm going to try and if i get picked they'll obviously know so during the whole course of about 4 5 months when i first attended the trials in new york the indoors place that you were there and right through the games where i did pretty well they knew nothing about it and it was only later when ricardo powell called me up so i was driving from work i was working at main and it was a friday so i was supposed to come back home the same day so i was driving back home and powell called me and he said you have been selected for the third you have been shortlisted for the 
I just pulled over. I couldn't control my emotions. I just, I just started crying. And I remember I called my dad. Um, it was around four, four thirty in the morning, and he wouldn't pick up. I called my mom. She didn't pick up. And I think an hour later, he called me back, and I had to tell him the whole story of me attending the trials from New York, the indoors place, to all the games that we played in between. And then I told him I'd been shortlisted for the thirty. And I think he just broke down too. Like it was unreal. Um, at that point, I just realized like it's now or never. Like I could have. So they asked me if I wanted to do the three. If I wanted to wait for three years or just put in the hundred days of work. I told them it's hundred days any day. Like nobody gets this opportunity. Um, and I'm so glad it all worked out well. I had to put in all those hours of coaching and development and make sure I'm training too. So all those days of hard work just. has got me here but again like this is only the start i'm just grateful for what has happened and we'll see how it goes on from here you had a pretty successful double life there hiding all of this from your parents did you ever think about another career in the cia or the fbi as a as a secret agent nash <laughs> oh i think i did a good job and yeah after that they started reading the articles of what was happening the cricket scene in us because they didn't know much about cricket here Yes, back in two thousand three, we had played the World Cup, and my dad used to tell me back then that U.S. has a team. You can go play in the U.S., but it was it wasn't something that we spoke seriously about, or it was it was way down in the future. So we didn't think of it at all. So, and then they had to catch up. They realized what was happening. So it was yeah, it was a lot of unraveling. <laughs> You, so you referenced that 2004 is the Champions Trophy that USA was in. USA played Australia and New Zealand, and they got absolutely right. slaughtered in the two games they played in England in the Champions Trophy that year. But being a cricket fan, you were aware. So it wasn't like you came to the US in 2015 and it was like, oh my God, they play cricket here. You actually had an idea of some sense that there was a national team at the very least, even though you might not have known the extent of club cricket. What was your impression or your initial impressions of club cricket and local cricket and the cricket you were first exposed to when you came to the U.S. that then inspired you or connected you to the point where you then applied to go to the combines in the Bronx and Van Cortlandt Park where you were first identified? First, I think it was a it was a bit of a shock because of course I knew the U.S.A. was playing cricket and. that played the 2004 champions trophy but i wasn't sure of the extent of which the club systems were and the kind of cricket that was played locally in new york because when i was in virginia i knew there was a lot of cricket in maryland but i've not had not seen any players or had any conversations with any of the cricket guys so once i saw the amount of cricket that was being played in new york and there were, i don't know the the numbers but there were plenty of leagues that were happening there were more than 50 60 teams playing in four five different leagues i knew that was something i could do in the weekends for sure and then take it from there but as in when i played more games in new york even the quality of cricket that was being played was supreme because most of the players were from the caribbean who had played good cricket in jamaica barbados and when they played club cricket it was like they wanted to win it wasn't just you know just play for the weekend yes it was recreational but they would still train once or twice a week it was there was still a serious form of cricket that were playing so i was shocked but and then i just i just went on with it but i definitely didn't expect there would be so much cricket at the time when i came here in terms of the quality facilities there's obviously great disparity in terms of what you would have grown up with in india if you're playing for your engineering college i'm imagining you were playing on turf wickets or fairly good quality standard of a facility compared to in New York in particular there's no turf wickets it's all artificial wickets putting aside the infrastructure issues that exist in the US how would you compare the quality of player and the level of challenge that you were exposed to in India and the standard you play there compared to the initial club cricket and league cl- cricket you were playing in New York in particular um i think in india when i played club cricket there the first division um club teams in bangalore were of highest quality um you had all the the guys who are playing in the ranji team now and for india they were all playing division 1 club cricket in india so be it mayank agarwal manish pandey all the guys who were from karnataka they were all playing in the league there so and the facilities like you said the turf wickets they're all of highest pedigree so coming from there to here it was 
I would say the kind of cricket that's played here in the US is very different. They're more aggressive in nature. In India, I found that they were more skillful in terms of being more street smart. They were they would use their hands, they would use their feet. It was more of skill work. And in the US, I found these guys could hit it big. In New York, like the Jamaicans or the West Indians, they relied more on hitting big. So if they hit a six, it would go over the parking lot. It would hit crash into a Sears. So that was a change that I had to India. In India, it was more of just grind it through. You bowl good area. There's a lot of spin. So if you have to get, score a hundred, it's a well tough fought out hundred. But here, they would if good ball or bad ball, they had the power to clear clear the stands. So it was more about adapting more than anything else. And I think that may be stronger as well because. But at the same time, like if they're going for big shots and. If they're looking for scoring shots all the time, then I realize that even I'm in the game all the time because they're going to offer more chances. And in Bangalore, there's a lot of two-day games. Um, even the Division One, Division Two, it's two-day games. So you bowl with more attacking fields, and it's more about patience. But here we play a lot of 50 overs, 40 overs. So it was it was a more fast-paced game. So it was just about about that adaptability. When did you realize? you were good enough to compete for the national team in the sense of within club cricket, forget about being invited to national trials in Florida and what Ricardo Powell had asked you and other selectors and administrators asked you about, do you want to commit to this hundred day requirement or do you just want to wait out three years and not worry about that? That's one issue. The other issue is there's a very huge and thriving club cricket scene in terms of money, money in club cricket with things like the U.S. Open and a whole lot of other private tournaments that are run on holiday weekends, whether it's the 4th of July or Memorial Day weekend or Labor Day weekend. For people outside of the U.S. who aren't aware, some players can get $500 a match, $1,000 a weekend, $5,000 a weekend if they're coming from the West Indies in particular. You see Andre Russell come out to a lot of these events, Sunil Narayan, Ravi Rampal, other players. Nicholas Puran is a regular player who appears at some of these events. And the USA players or the people who are on the USA radar, they are constantly traveling around even before the central contract structure came into place a couple years ago with ODI status. So at what stage did you go from being just Nastush Kenjige, the random club cricketer who nobody knows about, to all of a sudden you started getting phone calls from people recruiting you and asking you, hey, can you show up to this tournament? We want to fly you out to this tournament. Can, do you want to be part of our team? Yeah, so first when I started in New York, it was a team called Columbia Cricket Club. I did pretty well there, but at the same time, when I was doing well there, I just got it. I got, I got a call from the combines. So I was involved in the combines region too. So once I started doing well in that circuit, the guys who were in the US team, they started tagging me along for the, their teams. Um, that helped because I could then just play along with them in all these major tournaments that happen around the US. But I think in terms of belief and in terms of how, of when I thought I was good enough to get into the US team, even at that point, I just remember telling myself, irrespective of if I make it or not, I just wanted to give it the best that I had. And I've always had the self-belief. I think that's one thing that's in me all the time that's helped me get to where I am. And for me, that comes from preparation. I know I prepare to the best of my abilities, irrespective of the conditions, the situations. And once I'm preparing well and giving it my all every day, then I know I can reach where I want to reach. That's always been one of my biggest philosophies. And I think it comes from my dad. He's always pushed me when things were not going well even in India. So in New York, when I got drafted into the combines and then I was playing well in the club cricket, I always knew if I just keep doing the right things and just doing what is supposed to be done and not worry about who calls me and what happens when I go do there, if I don't do well. I think it was all about just staying in the process and in the present. And regarding money, I if I remember I played, even after I got selected for the combines, the 30, I remember I went to Little Rock and I went to two, three more places playing for free. I always believe that money will come when it has to. I've never chased money, even though it's it's funny to say because yes, you need money to live and stuff, but I always believe that if you take care of the stuff that matters and if you give, if I can give my time, my effort to cricket, cricket will take care of me. I've always believed that. So money followed me later on, but it's never been my priority. Even now, I don't go to teams that offer me the most money or anything like that. So 
it's just been cricket cricket and i'll continue to do that way because it's just what i believe in it's always different for different people because people are in different stages of their career and they have different priorities but for me it was always cricket first and everything else second you mentioned columbia cricket club for people who aren't aware i was also at one time a member of columbia cricket club though not at the same time as nash but a number of the players that you would have played with so like ajay jay chopra madura guys who've been around the club for a long time i was around there and got to play in, in the scene so I, my six degrees of separation i can say i am from the same club as a u.s <laughs> national team member but the standard of cricket at columbia that we played in the club cricket team there it was not the standard that would attract the attention of the USA national team. So again, I guess what I mean from that standpoint is not, not to be disrespectful to my fellow Columbia cricket alumni in uh, New York city, but on a, just a very realistic sense, was there a tournament or a, a sequence where you can think of where somebody called you up and invited you or was recruiting you where you, it kind of clicked in your head, like, oh, this isn't just some like random pipe dream. I've got like, oh, I, I want to play for the USA national team. A lot of people say, oh, I want to play for USA. I want to play for USA. I want to play international cricket. Where it went from that to person X called me up, like aside from Ricardo Powell, you know, somebody else in, in, a, in a club team in one of these franchise events called you up and it was like, oh, geez, like they actually want me. Like they must think I'm pretty good. Like maybe I do actually have a shot at, at making this happen. Yeah, there were plenty. So one is, I think, um, in New York, I was playing. I was also playing for Atlantis Cricket Club, and Steve Masaya. He was playing in the same league, and we played against each other. So Steve, I'd watched him play in the 20, 2004 Champions Trophy. So when I saw him playing in New York, I connected the dots. So I went and spoke up to him. I spoke to him after the game, and he was pretty impressed. He was actually more impressed with my batting than my bowling, which was strange. So, <laughs> at that point, did you pull out the reverse sweep against Steve Messiah's seed? <laughs> that was early. So, at that point in 2016, to be frank, in India, I never worked a lot on my batting. It was just bowling because it was hard enough to just manage college exams, assignments, and then cricket practice. So, whenever I went for cricket practice, it would just be bowling, fielding. So, it was never batting. I never put in any effort on my batting. And in 2016, when no 20 yeah 2016, Steve told me that I that at that moment I told myself, okay, hold on, he thinks there's something in my batting, but I'm a bowler. So at that point, it made me realize if if that could take me a long way. And then one thing led to another. Um, there was a tournament in Little Rock, um, Arkansas, that I played, um, where all these big guys were playing, and I defended four. I think it was four or five runs in the last over to win the finals. That, that helped me get some more tournaments, some more teams calling me for other tournaments and then ended up playing all the other tournaments. So it was one, le one thing leading to another, but my focus was always the camps and the trial games that were in, in our schedule. So I would always have my eye on those and then play these tournaments as a stepping stone to do well in those trial games. And the stepping stone from those games got you into the national team. You got your USA call up for your maiden tour to go to Uganda in May of 2017 for World Cricket League Division Three. And the tour started off in South Africa. You guys went to Pachastrum for the start of that tour. And then you worked your way to Uganda for the first official match against Oman. When you first got the call that you'd been selected to tour with USA for the first time, take me through how you received the news and then also, what was it like and what did it mean to you to put on the USA uniform and suit up for your first ever international match? So before Uganda, there were those trial games and that was back in Houston where I did well. That was un unreal, like getting the 5-4 in the trial game. But before that, I remember I went to South Africa. I quit work at that point. I, I said, I'll, this is the time to quit. So I went to South Africa to train in January because in New York... There wasn't much going on. It was snowing. It was cold. I couldn't find any place to practice. So I thought I'll go to South Africa. And there I actually met a lot of guys who are here now. So I trained along with Shirley and Connie Dry. They were in their first class team over there in Free State. I stayed there for a month with those guys. And that gave me a lot of confidence coming back to Houston here to do well. And three months later, I was invited. I was I was chosen to play for the U.S. in Uganda. When the call came, I was in India. I was training in India at that point. I was with my parents when the email 
came to my inbox i couldn't have chosen a better moment so i was with my brother with my mom dad i got a email and it was all flashing over all the social media with those graphics and, and introducing all the players it was unreal like there is what what do you want to do yes you want to play for your country i was thinking of india when i was in india but now when i moved to the us you always want to play for the country that you grew up in and so i, I always believe like us it's a place where if you do well you'll always go higher there there's it's all about how much you put in how much you get so it was unreal um uganda it wasn't a tour that we did very well in um i think we should have advanced we didn't advance but it was a tour of mixed emotions um the first game against oman i hardly remember a thing i just remember standing in a line for the national anthem in the beginning it was raining and then nothing in between it just went in a flash <laughs> i think i had a 7 or a 8 over spell uh, just one wicket but nothing that i can nothing special in that game but the whole tour i think we should have done a lot better um but the the way in which the team welcomed me in including captain steve and uh, steve taylor and uh, the coach pugudu i think he's had a big impact on me as a player and development and stuff like that so it was just in- un- unbelievable Today's episode of the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast presented by Dream Cricket is also sponsored by Musa Cricket Stadium, the first and original turf wicket facility in the state of Texas, and now one of the premier venues for the minor league cricket T20 franchise tournament. Located at 5515 McKeever Road in Pearland, five miles off the Bailey Road exit from State Route 288 and a half hour south of downtown Houston, Musa Cricket Stadium includes fully enclosed locker rooms and change rooms plus shower facilities after day's play, as well as outdoor nets for all your training needs. For more information, call 713-534-2195. That's Musa Cricket Stadium in Pearland, Texas. You say you don't remember much from that day, but you you took one wicket. I tell you what I remember from that day. That game was played at Entebbe. And all I can remember from that day is during the national anthem in the early parts of the game, there was this biblical swarm of flies that descended onto the field and was basically attacking everybody <laughs> and like during the national anthem i've got this picture i think it was you and maruno maruno patel where there's just yeah. flies all over the <laughs> both of you in the front of you and then exactly. yeah, yeah. steven <laughs> taylor when he was batting early in the game like he had to pause multiple times because he was just trying to like swat all the flies out from his face <laughs> and under his helmet it was it's very peculiar and i thought like is this how it is every time you i think that was just a unique appearance there were a few other games that were down there. I don't think they were like that, but I remember that your wicket, Zeeshan Maksud, now the current Oman captain at the time, he was a regular player in the team. Now he's the captain. So it's, that's a pretty good feather in your cap for a first international wicket. No, I should think you're being a little bit modest with <laughs> how you characterize the memory caught by Ali Khan. Uh-huh. So I'm assuming that was, caught in the deep or may have been caught short mid wicket that's usually where Ali Khan was feeling it at those sequences yeah all right he was at uh, deep mid wicket so i remember that wicket very well but at that point i didn't know who he was i didn't know who zishan makshud was so now since you tell me i know it's a big wicket now yeah I, he tried to hit me over mid wicket and ali took a very good catch in deep mid you lost that game and like you said, it was a disappointing tour, all things considered. It took a last day miracle from Elmore Hutchinson basically to, to save you guys from being relegated in the last match against the host Uganda. Uh, but you finished the tour with seven wickets, which was the second most on the tour. Stephen Taylor had 10. He took five, I believe, and that went against Uganda on the last day to overtake you in the wickets list. All things considered, how would you evaluate how that experience was for you in the context of the team? And what did you take away from that to then want to focus on and work on to continue getting better? Coming into that tour, there was a lot more pressure on the guys who were already the senior players. So we had all the seniors in Timra Allen, you had Steven Taylor and the guys who had already played for a long time, Elmore, Timbal. So for me, it wasn't there was a, there was not a lot of pressure i just wanted to enjoy myself and think looking back at it now like i think i was a bit naive too like there's so much that i've learned in the last 2 3 years like that 
that I could have used back then. But that is what experience is all about. Um, reverse sweep. You didn't use the reverse sweep on that tour, Nash. That's why you say you couldn't <laughs> get promoted. You've learned that you picked up the reverse sweep in the switch hit since then. I remember in that tour, yeah, it was, I batted a lot with Elmo. I remember having, I think it was a 60 ball partnership or an 80 ball partnership as well, where I would just block out all the balls and let him do the hitting. Um, even in the game against Uganda, I just remember blocking, 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 and he would just come on strike and hit it all over the place. And I remember thinking, damn, how, how, how does he do it so easily? <laughs> so I tried to pick his brain as well. So trying to get better with whatever I can. Um, in terms of bowling, it was a, I wouldn't say a very good tour, but I was quite happy with the performances, especially against Canada as well. Canada was a strong team back then in that tournament. At that point, I was happy, but at the same time, I knew I had to keep getting better because you just can't remain stagnant at any point and say, okay, this is it now. So soon after the tour, I had, remember having a chat with Pugudu, asking where I could get better. It wasn't a good atmosphere at that point because we, were, we didn't get promoted. So I still remember going into his room and asking him what, where, what we can do and where we are headed. And I went back to India and then started working on a few things from there. Earlier... You said, I was working my jobs in, in New York and around the Northeast, and I was pursuing cricket, but I still had to make a living. And you said, I can't just quit my job. I still have to make money. But then you followed it up with, oh, I quit my job to go to South Africa to play cricket and hang out with Shadley Van Skalvik and Corne Dry and whoever else. I think you left out Tina Sabrine and a few other names in there. So this is one of the things that I've heard. To what extent, I don't know how much of it is true, but you have cycled through maybe more jobs in a very niche field than perhaps anybody in the biomedical equipment industry. <laughs> How many jobs did you either you either quit or were fired? Because employers only give you two weeks. In America, you get two weeks leave. That's it. So <laughs> yeah, playing for USA is a huge honor, but they want somebody showing up to the job who is actually going to show up at 9 a.m. and fix the equipment and playing for USA is not going to help get their x-ray and CAT scan machines fixed and their MRI machines fixed. They need somebody to do that. You go through a bunch of jobs because every time you went away on US tour, and this was this was why getting central contracts was such a big deal and getting ODI status because it meant a player in your position didn't have to quit a job every time you wanted to go on a tour. You could now focus on cricket full time. But how many jobs did you actually quit or were fired from over this whole two, two to three years kind of process in order to continue pursuing your true passion, which was cricket? It was quite a lot. So I'll let you in on a secret. I, I got fired more than more than the times I quit the job. <laughs> so there were times when I actually got fired from three jobs and it wasn't pretty, but <laughs> at that point it was, if you ask me, like, I, I, I don't even know why at that point, everybody kept saying I was stupid, I was this, don't do that, this is US. But at that point, it just seemed the right thing to do. Like, every time I got fired, I said, all right, now it might come across as a joke. But at that point, I just said, okay, never mind, next one, <laughs> next one. So all I was doing was looking at it from a short point of view, from, from the job perspective. I was just looking at next six months. I was looking at what tour was coming up and then just making sure... I worked just that much to get across. And then by the time the next tour came along, I either asked them for leave, which they wouldn't give because like you said, it's just not even, I think it was 10 days of absence for a year. So they would either say no, and I would still go and then get fired or just get around. <laughs> Alexa, stop. Alexa, stop. <laughs> 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 Alexa's is worried about you. Alexa's is worried about you getting fired again, Nash. It's okay. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, was just... well, let me ask you, were you so good at fixing all this equipment that no matter how many times you get fired, somebody was always going to call you up because you were that much in demand that you were so damn good at fixing this equipment and diagnosing the issues? To be honest, I wasn't. No. <laughs> if you go through the reference in my ex-colleagues I don't think they'll have a lot of good things to say because all I was do was just try to get out early and then come in late to work it's not the same thing with cricket though <laughs> I don't think there are a lot of people who would say nice things about me at work but yeah it was well there were some of the guys helped me 
to get a job in California that didn't work out because I didn't want to move to Cali at that point. There was an opportunity in Jersey from one of the cricket guys that I had to turn down because there was a tour coming up. So it was all just short-term focuses. <laughs> so none of these places that you were, none of them are, are have a framed photo in a jersey with Nastish Kenjigay's. This is our proud ex-employee. <laughs> <laughs> there's one 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 or two bosses Ruben was a very good boss even there's a there's there's one team from the first job that I worked at they were very supportive of at least those two weeks and then giving me those offs when I needed just for the Friday or Thursday training camp but at that point yeah you can only expect so much from the corporate world here they're not going to pay you and say go play cricket all the cricket that you want and we'll take care of you that's just not going to happen so it was just realistic that I know, you know, I just quit at that point. But until then, I obviously couldn't let them know that I'm here for only so long because then they wouldn't take me in the first place. So I think I was a little selfish in, in those acts, but I just got the job done, just the bare minimum. I would just do the bare minimum and keep everyone happy, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like the first job that you described, you said, well, one of my bosses was actually happy. It's like, oh, we've got somebody who plays for USA. And then at, by the second, third tour, I was like, oh, geez, we got somebody who plays for USA. That's exactly what would happen, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the first time I went on a tour, they would be excited, send out emails, send out, send out all kinds of pamphlets to everybody, that, this, that. And then by the time the third tour came about, they said, is this all you're going to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, wasn't pretty. <laughs> All right. So you said you were fired from three jobs. How many did you quit? Did you lose track? Quit as in I lost. Um, so it was more of me turning down offers more than they, they selecting me and then me quitting. I'm a kind of person who's fine. It's very hard to say no. So there would be times when I would say yes, join, and then they would fire me. I would just wait for them to fire me. <laughs> so for me to quit, I think there's just one place where it was a mutual thing where I told him, listen, this is not going to work out because we have a full calendar coming up and then it was mutual. Yeah. Now, we're, we're laughing about it now. You said it's funny now. It wasn't funny at the time. No, no. <laughs> You've made it to the USA. You're now a full-time player. But aside from the personal stress, I, I would imagine this put you through at certain times. What was your family thinking the first two, three years, they were, they were over the moon. I mean, if I was excited, they, would, they were a hundred times like, more excited. They would go around telling all the family and sending pictures of me, the articles. Because I think that is one thing they, if you ask them 15, 20 years ago what they wanted me to do, they would say play cricket for the country. And that is what I've been doing. So the first two, three years, they were okay with it. And then there comes a time when they start asking you, are they looking after you? What's what's with the contracts? Is there any certainty? Is there any kind of a plan? Because there was a time when you would play one tournament and then you wouldn't know what's going to happen next for the next three, four months. You just didn't know if there was a camp coming up. And even if a camp came up, it would be with one week's notice. So it wasn't it wasn't the best ideal situation. But at all times, they've been 100% supportive. So if not for them, it would have been much harder. Um, they They've just told me, just do whatever you think best suits you. Because that comes from the fact, I think, because they know I can go back. I think they think that I can go back to the medical field, but I don't know if I can go back to that field. Uh, so one of my other motives to just keep performing and doing the best I can is because I don't want to go back to the medical field and work there. <laughs> but they'll be 100%. I mean, they can't ask for anything better. So they're just happy. What made you so driven or so determined to actually believe and stick with this and not give up and not say, all right, you know what, I've been fired from three jobs or, you know, would it have been four jobs or five jobs? Or it, was there a certain point where you, where you had set kind of like a, a deadline in your own mind where you said, all right, if we don't have full-time contracts or if we don't get ODI status, then you know what, I've got to really prioritize earning and I can't keep doing what I'm doing because after a certain point, even after I retire, by the time, you know, 35, 40, you might not have cricket you still got to have a job after cricket and you could be burning future lifelong career prospects did any of that ever enter your mind or were you just thinking in the immediate no matter what happens I'm just going to continue pursuing this until it fails or you know it just it just doesn't happen because I don't have a plan b 
Yeah, I remember in 2016, when I, when I, um, in 2017, when Tom Evans was running the whole combines and I made it to the 30, he sent an email. He said, this is going to be a long-term plan where it's a five-year plan. We're looking at developing players for the next five years, picking a team, making a good culture. This was along with Pugudu. So I knew I would give it everything for those five, five years at least. So until 2022, I just knew it would just be cricket. Obviously, you don't want to put timelines in in a sport because five years is a very long time in any sport. In the back of my head, I just knew it would be five years of just cricket. I didn't mind not having a job and whatnot until 2022. But then as years rolled on by, um, we started. So we would we knew we made it to the ODIs and we have a World Cup in 2023. There's a T20 World Cup next year. There's a T20 World Cup in 2024. So one thing led to another. I think it's just having those goals in mind. If you ask me today, like, I want to give it everything. So whatever I do, whatever I'm doing today, I just want to make sure that I keep giving my best until maybe the 2024 World Cup. Again, like, if you ask me, if we, if you interview me in 2027, then I can go backward and connect the dots. But right now it's very hard. So it's just giving your best every day and then just, you know, taking it day by day and just staying in the present. But we have so much cricket now in the calendar. There's so much to look forward to. And at the same time, it's you got to keep improving because it's not going to get any easier. Now, you mentioned the 2024 T20 World Cup, and there's also another T20 World Cup coming up next year. Nash, you were the leading wicket taker in the last T20 tournament you played for USA in North Carolina. You took 12 wickets for USA in 2018, and you haven't been picked in a T20 match for USA since then. What the hell is going on? <laughs> yeah, apart from work, I think even in cricket, even when you get picked for US, there's always going to be up and downs. It's not in my control. Like I cannot control a few things, but I'm obviously disappointed that I've not been in the T20 mix in, in the last tournament as well. So all I can do from my end is just keep getting better. I just want to make sure that I'll be the best that I can ever be. So it's just about getting up every day and just trying to do that. But looking, yeah, I think I had a good tournament in North Carolina. So it was a little surprising after that that I haven't played. Um, but there's so much cricket to go. So just got to be optimistic and keep looking forward. Are we going to have to organize a protest, a picket outside of uh, DeBartolo Way in, in Santa Clara, <laughs> outside of Parag Marathi's office at Levi Stadium to get you back into the uh-huh. T20 team? <laughs> well, we haven't. Yeah, I think we've played about what, five to ten games now of T20 that I haven't played, but... Uh, well, you didn't uh, go on the Bermuda Tour. So, Bermuda 2019, I can say the reason why USA lost that, <laughs> that didn't qualify in Bermuda in 2019, they left on Kenjike. What happened? <laughs> the, the, this recent tour, now, you know, they went undefeated, so there's a little bit less of um, an argument to try and squeeze you back into the team, but two years ago, the Nash energy, the Nash, the Nash firepower, it wasn't there. Yeah, personally, it was a big disappointment because I'd done well before that as well. But there's been so many changes in terms of management as well because Pubudu left and then the new set of coaches came. I think they stayed for some time and then now Jack is here. So it was all a transition period where sometimes it happens because different coaches have different plans and then there's they're still new, so they're figuring it out. But I think for me as a player, I cannot be looking at all those things. It's... What's got me so far is what I've been doing on the field. So I have to just continue doing what I do. And I'm just glad that we did well in um, Antigua. And we have a big series in Zimbabwe up next. So all I can do is just prepare. Do you consider yourself just now a 50 over bowler? Or do you really target a way to get back into the T20 team? No, definitely not. No, if you ask me, like... I haven't labeled myself as a 50 bowler or a T20 or anything of that sort because obviously I haven't played, but it's because the selectors haven't picked me. It's not that I don't want to play or anything like that. So I would obviously love to play and be part of the T20 side where I can do well. Um, I want to win games for the US team. So that's what I want to do, irrespective of T20, 50. And I think if you have the skills for 50, you definitely have the skills for T20. You just need to be a little smarter and stay ahead of the game. Um, I will get my chance at some point. So I just need to make sure I'm prepared when that chance comes. You heard it here first. Naj said he's getting his chance. He's going to make it happen. <laughs> get out of his way. Get out of his way. 
<laughs> no fear. I just say I will get a chance at some point. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so I just got to be ready when that comes. USA's got the two T20Is and three ODIs. First ever matches against a test nation for USA on American soil. Again, 2004, USA played Australia and New Zealand, but that was in England. First match was for USA on American soil against the test nation. What would it mean to you to be a part of a starting love in, in December in Florida for that series? Oh, it's a big series, right? So it's, there's a lot riding on it. Um, Ireland obviously is a great side. They've just beaten England. They're they're a top top ten nation. So it'll be a good experience. Um, you always want to see how you fare with these guys. Um, you play the sport to know where you stand against the top guys. So it will be a really good series. Um, it's it's our home ground in Florida, so we obviously have the advantage. Five games. It's it's definitely going to be fun. Yeah. What are you most looking forward to about that experience? I think it's just the experience of playing against a top team. Um, yes, we have played against other top teams too, but this is one team that's, they know what they're doing. They're very skillful and they play to their strengths. Um, on their day, they can be explosive, but at the same time, like I play the, we play the sport because you need to look at your side and not worry about who you're playing. You just want to compete with the best. So it'll be nice to see where you stand against this top team and then, there are going to be more teams that are going to be of similar caliber in June. So it's just a test in the short term that you can access, just know where you stand and stuff. Yeah. One or two other questions before we get to the favorite 11. Mm-hmm. Your dad, your your family. Now you've gotten a chance to play for USA all around the world, but one of the most special experiences I would imagine for you was going to Nepal in February 2020 because your dad, your mom, and I think some of your aunts, your your mom's sisters, I believe, came to Nepal. They were in the crowd in Kathmandu. There was a special VIP section just for the <laughs> American fans, and your family made up the overwhelming majority of that VIP American fan section. And I, I'll never forget you were on the field as a subfielder in one game at mid-off, I believe it was. And you took this insane one-handed leaping catch on the ring and the whole stadium went silent. It was against Nepal, I believe. And the only person I could hear in the stadium when the stadium went silent was your dad. It could only have been your dad who went, yes, yes, (laughs) started screaming, going out of his mind. (laughs) I thought, what a cool moment it was. For your dad and your family to be there. Take us through that moment, that experience. What did it mean for you to, for the first time, to have your parents and your family be able to see you in person and, and have a special moment like that? Yeah, it's truly a, spe- a special feeling when your family comes all the way to watch you play for US. So, yeah, you're right. It was my dad, mom, aunt, uncle. So they were, they came all the way to Nepal to watch us play in Nepal, and it was a packed stadium. The crowd there was insane. I'm not sure of the numbers, but we were playing Nepal and I just found out that I won't be playing. So I was extra disappointed because they were there and then I wasn't playing. So I was just sitting there, just watching the game, giving drink, getting the drinks out and stuff. And then I was called into field because I was the 12th man. And I just think every, every, every small chance that you get is an opportunity. So, I mean, obviously now it feels like, Oh wow. I just took that catch and it was insane. And, but at that point, I, would, I just wanted to do the best that I could when I went in. Obviously, I was disappointed I couldn't bowl or anything. But at that point, all I was thinking was do well, any half chance, something that I can contribute to the team. Then it worked out in such a way that they were watching and then I happened to take that very good catch. So they were excited. Um, they have been the biggest fans for me during all these years. So something to cherish for the rest of the tour for them, apart from their shopping and (laughs) them having fun. Yeah, just that small little moment. (laughs) For somebody who is an American citizen who grew up mostly in India, to then come to America, and it's not just the cricket. You said, you touched on it, you characterize, you come to America and it's a place that you love because if you put in the work, you're going to get rewarded for it. So what does it mean to you to be an American, first and foremost? And what does it mean to you to be able to represent USA? I think it's it's a land of opportunities, right? Like, I still think compared to other places here, you can build what you want to, want to showcase to the world. So if you have something to showcase to the world, you can always build it. If you have the right foundations, if you have the right 
perspective and the right focus and stuff like that i think it's a place where people will help and support you to build your dream i think that's true here because remember when i came in 2015 like i could have been passed on because i hadn't lived here and stuff like that but they were still supportive and at this point i'm just thinking win games for the us team so there's no other anything else that i'm thinking about it's just the yeah, whichever game i play just be a match winner and you have been a match winner on numerous occasions for you <laughs> say and you will be in the future not just with the ball but with that reverse sweep and the switch hit which was <laughs> a thing of beauty in Texas at the USA national championships. Now, Nash, I gotta, I gotta give you a hard time a little bit on this. You posted some photos I saw on social media of, of, uh-huh. of the team at the nationals and you playing for the Southwest captaining the Southwest, but the photo you didn't post was you playing the switch hit in the reverse sweep. I, I made sure to get a shot of you doing it and you didn't put it out there for the world to see. What gives, man? Oh, there's a story behind that, Peter. So <laughs> what happened was, First, I went through the photos that USA Cricket had posted, and I just saw those three photos. That's it, of me, nothing else. <laughs> so I said, "Come on, Peter, you missed all the shots from the previous game, <laughs> and you just have one shot of me just just batting with Shashank, and there's no nothing shots, no shots of me playing the ball." And then I take those three pictures, post it, and then the same evening, an email comes regarding the whole summary of the nationals, and they say, "If you want to see the photos." click here and then i open i click there and i see all these photos from peter de la pena showing me missing the switch hit and playing the scoop and i go damn it <laughs> now what am i going to do about these photos <laughs> and those are good photos as well so i'd already posted these three i said no i'm not going to push and post some more <laughs> oh so you scored an unbeaten 85 in one match a match winning unbeaten 85 <laughs> to go from a number 11 where you started your career for USA to now be so highly regarded that you were promoted above Jasper and Malhotra of 173 not out fame and six sixes fame and and Saurav Nechavalkar he was giving me a hard time I, I said after you <laughs> made that score we were in the hotel in, in Houston and I said oh I, I guess Jack was was pressuring Jack Jack knew what he was doing putting Naj at, at number five ahead of Jack's gun. So everyone goes, Jack, what do you mean, Jack? Who says it was, my, who says it wasn't my idea? You don't want to give me any credit. What if I was the one who thought it? I'm the one who believes in Naj's batting. So, so quick, take us through the evolution of Naj's Kenji game from number 11 to all the way up to number five to USA and in the middle over to the Southwest as a reverse sweeping, switch hitting, scooping demon well the first thing about southwest is i was the captain so you know i don't have anybody to answer to except the coach so i just pad up and walk in <laughs> well no in all seriousness i think jack has been very instrumental um he's given me the confidence that i can bat that's very important because if it comes from the coach and the coach believes that you can bat it really helps and even from the times of pubudu where he's helped me through my batting it's just been a gradual process where i've just got better better um, there's still a lot more work to do. I still need to score a lot of runs. I think it's just from the support from guys like Saurabh and Jack who have believed in me. And it's just helped me just concretely believe in myself more and then just train and train. And I'm just happy I got the runs in nationals. But again, like I just need to keep working and make sure I keep piling, I keep scoring runs. Nash, I believe in you too. I, I put you in most of my spots in the minor league Dream 11. I can see a century. <laughs> In the future, for Nash Tushkenjigay for USA. Make it happen, Nash. Sure, Peter. After the post on Twitter, yeah, I should. <laughs> My brother sent that to me and I said, what, what is going on here? <laughs> oh, well, All right, favorite 11 afraid. time, Nash. <laughs> favorite 11. So, 11 questions. Now, r- random things, cricket and non-cricket. Your favorite roommate on any cricket tour? Xavier Marshall. <laughs> Why the X-Man? It's just that right now we are so comfortable. Like, I just know what time he wakes up, how much time he needs at the restroom, and then it's time for me to go in. And then it's all its all a, just a good mechanism where we know what time he comes out, what time I go in, what temperature we need in the room, when does curtains close. <laughs> so we've been rooming for a long time. Uh, so, yeah, I would stick with him. 
You said you're waiting on, on his routine. Shouldn't he be waiting on your routine? You're the big dog in the in that room. <laughs> well, no, um, I don't know about that. I want to see what he says about that. <laughs> your favorite way to spend a 14 plus hour long haul flight. I would say audible. I like to, I don't like to read books because I just don't have the patience, but I like to listen to books. So I would listen to a book. You currently live in Texas. Talked about you start off in Virginia and New York. You're now a resident in Texas. <laughs> Grew up in India. So what is the favorite city that you've lived in? That's a hard one. Um, can I give you two? <laughs> I'll give you a couple of them. Bangalore. <laughs> Bangalore and Dallas. <laughs> If we had to make a pick of the two, which would you choose? For the current situation, Dallas. Your favorite cricket ground experience that you've had as a player or as a fan? There have been quite a few that come to mind. A few a, I would go with Sharjah. Yeah, just the whole vibe of, you know, I'd watch Sachin Bad in Sharjah and then um, just to stay in the same, when we played against UAE and Scotland, to go to that same dressing room and the same pitch and the same ground, just relive. You, I could see like what Sachin would have hit and how people would have done that, this, and to play that, yeah, Shaja. Your favorite cricketer of all time? Has to be Rahul Dravid. A fellow Karnatican. Why Rahul Dravid? Just the way he goes about his business off and on the field. Like, I think I've told you before, like, there would be times when he was the Indian test captain, but when he was in Bangalore, he would come back and play for his club, the first division club that he plays for, and he would still field all the 90 overs standing in slips, even when he didn't have to. Like, he can just, just go sit down, come back, and then go back and sit down. But he wouldn't do that. Like, he would make sure he's fully committed to the team, dive around and just stand in slips all day long and help the boys out. The things that he does, yeah, dedication, commitment, the passion that he has. Your favorite non-cricket athlete of all time? Go with Fedra. Fedra comes to mind. Just his poise outside, like we all know what he does on the tennis court, but the impact that he's had outside as well. Just a perfect role model. No controversies, just, yeah. Your favorite place to eat out? on tour away from home that's a hard one i'm not a footy i know you love five guys in chick-fil-a but <laughs> um, usually i'm so what i usually do is for breakfast i usually have my own oats so i carry my breakfast wherever i go and usually for dinner i'm not the kind of guy who would go out and try a certain thing because it would just be go with the guys who they go wherever they go just go eat but i like thai food i like thai i like sushi Interesting. Thai food is very popular in Australia. When I did my semester abroad there, that was the first place where I discovered Thai food is very, very, very popular. I don't really see too many Thai restaurants around the U.S. It's more you see a lot of Chinese restaurants and Indian restaurants, but it's very hard. Where, where is the Thai restaurant that you would find on the road? I'm curious. The one we went to last time in Cali. So when we had the camp, Saurabh took us to a place. Um, I don't remember the name, but that was a really nice Thai place. Yeah, I've never found hard hard to get Thai food though. Yeah, maybe if you don't go to Five Guys, if you don't look up Five Guys, you should find it. <laughs> I, I like my Five Guys. Come on, come on, Naj. Nothing wrong with a good Five Guys. Especially when they actually remember to give you your fries instead of claiming that they run out of them when they actually have it in the liars. That was just one one bad experience in New Jersey though. What, what would be your, what's your go-to dish on a Thai menu? What would you typically order at a Thai restaurant? Um, I usually like red curry or green curry. And then, um, yeah, one of those two, just those curries. As the proud son of the finest grower of coffee in Karnataka, what is your favorite type of coffee? Um, it's a filter coffee. <laughs> so that <laughs> You don't have a specific type of bean, like a, a, a particular bean that you would say you want to have brewed? It's just filtered um, coffee? We'll go with um, Arabica. Arabica. Oh, yes. Yeah. Arabica beans. Yes. I know the yeah. Arabica beans. Robusta is good too, but yeah, stick to Arabica. Arabica beans. Okay. Your favorite type of pizza topping? Definitely not pineapple. <laughs> I'd go with pepperoni. Your favorite movie of all time? There's a Hindi movie. It's called Three Idiots. I don't know if you've watched it. 
I am well aware of three. It's it's got uh, Amir Khan is one of the uh-huh. idiots. I know that much. That's my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> so much meaning in that movie. All I know, all I remember from that movie, Nash. Mm-hmm. All is well. All is well. <laughs> all is well. All is well. <laughs> all the time. Yep. All I is well. I must have watched it three, four times when I was younger. So much feeling. All is well. Finally, your favorite show to binge watch, whether it's on Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, Paramount Plus, your other favorite streaming service du jour or a DVD box set. If you're locked away in quarantine on a tour or just have all sorts of time to kill. Now that you don't have to go servicing all those medical devices and you can just train and play cricket and you got free time to spare. What is your go-to show to binge watch? I love the office. Yeah. That's something I could binge watch all day. <laughs> now, then... which one is it the UK version or the US version? Um, that's on that's on Netflix. I don't know if it's what version is. I think well, the, the UK US version, version, the main role was Ricky Gervais, and the US version is Steve Carell, who is the main role yeah, in the Steve office. Carell. Yeah, Steve the, Carell. The Steve Carell version of the office. Yeah. Okay. And Silicon Valley. I don't know if you watched it. I watched the first season or so of Silicon Valley. I I stopped after. I've I've heard it's since gotten very good after the first season. But I I kind of threw mm-hmm. in the towel after the first season. So the last year, the last one month and a half, I've been just watching Silicon Valley. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Nastush Kenjige, the king of the desert. Thank you for coming on the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast. I'll give you the final word. Anything else that you want to share with all the underlings in the desert that you'd like them to know about you that they don't already know? <laughs> no, nothing else. Um, I would just like to congratulate my brother who just got married. I couldn't be there because of all the commitments here but Shashank I wish you a happy married life and I'll be watching this later but apart from that thank you Peter for getting the US cricket word out to everyone the worldwide like you I think you've done a superb job that, but since I've been here at least like I don't know when you started <laughs> but you've covered each and everything so it goes out a long way because otherwise yeah not many people do it so thank you for getting the word out on USA cricket Astush uh, Kenjige, USA national team, all rounder. There's no doubt about it. It's, he's not just a left arm spinner, nor he's a true all rounder. Reverse sweeping and switch hitting his way sooner or later to a century. It's going to happen. Nash, thank you so much again for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Peter. Always a pleasure. Yeah, good fun. Whether you watch this episode on YouTube or you listen to the audio version, the smile is ever-present in Nastush Kenjige in his face and in his voice. Few people have more fun and with good reason. He's had quite a fun journey getting to the national team and took some risks that have paid off and he continues to enjoy success as a reward for all that payoff and hard work. And that continues against Ireland at the end of December when Nasus Genjige will be part of the ODI squad in the three matches that USA will take on Ireland. Those ODIs December 26th, 28th, and 30th at the Broward County Stadium in Florida. I want to remind everybody that you can, as I said, subscribe to the podcast in video form on YouTube or in audio format on Apple Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor FM, and numerous other podcasting platforms. That's it for this week's episode. I want to wish everybody a very, very Merry Christmas. And I hope to see some of you at the Broward County Stadium in Florida over the course of the five matches that USA plays against Ireland. Until next time, I'm Peter Dalton, reminding everybody, God bless America, and God bless American cricket.